What's up, everybody? Daniel Dan Sports News Flores here, bringing you the 21st episode of the Dan Sports News and Friends podcast. You can follow me on Twitter at Dan Sports News, Instagram at I am Dan Sports News, and Facebook at Dan Sports News to catch my latest articles and news in sports. Today's guest is two time NBA champion with the Boston Celtics, Greg Kite. He shares about winning championships, playing with multiple Hall of Famers, and a lot more. Check it out. How old were you when you first started playing basketball? Uh, First team I played when I was 10 years old. Were you always the best amongst the other kids in school growing up? Uh, the best basketball player, um, uh, for a lot of the time, but yeah, there was, uh, in time, uh, like in junior high school, I was growing a lot and was younger than some of the kids on the team and, and was not, uh, you know, not, not the best, one of the best players on the team now. So catching up with my, like seventh grade, you know, catching up with myself, you know, growing a lot, kind of getting my coordination, that kind of thing. Were you always taller? I kept working at it. Mm-hmm. Were you always taller than the other players? Um. Yeah, I mean, through through uh, um, through high school, I was taller than most other players. Yeah, I mean, there were a few players nationally who competed against, and a couple in the area was. Uh, as tall or maybe a seven footer or something like that, but but then once you get to once you get to the college and pros, there's lots of other guys who are six ten, six eleven, seven feet or taller. So no, wasn't always the tallest, but I was in the upper end of things. So, yeah. When did you realize you could play basketball at the next level? When it was always the next level. I mean, the first team I played on was YMCA, so the for the next the next level from there was junior high, I guess. Um, I guess you're talking about going to the pros and things like that, right? Going to NBA, right? And college. Um, yeah, I would say that as a ten year old, really uh, ten eleven year old, when I first started playing, kind of my I had an older brother, and he he was a high school player and played on this really good church team too, and and. Uh, and uh got to lot to watch a lot of grew up in Houston, Texas. Got to see some great teams in the University of Houston, Rockets. So I got excited about basketball. I liked other sports and played other sports, but ever since I was about ten, eleven years old, even though I loved baseball and football and all that, I wanted to be a one first I wanted to be a high school basketball player like my brother, but I also had a goal and dreams with him. I wanted to be a college and and pro basketball player. But I knew that it wouldn't just even as a 10, 11, 12 year old, I knew it wasn't just going to happen, that I had to work really hard at it. So it's not just having the goal and thinking you could make it, but it was, you know, putting your mind to it and putting the work in. Right. Now, you were a McDonald's All American, um, which everyone knows is the highest honor for a high school basketball player. What do you remember about that 1979 McDonald's All American game? Uh, they gave us free Big Macs. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah, we did get we did get plenty of McDonald's food. I actually uh, the McDonald's High School of American Game. Unfortunately, I had um, um, got my hand broken the week before and had a watch. So that was, but it was a great uh, game with a lot of great uh, players. I'd actually gone on. I was going on some recruiting visits during that time. And I'd gone on a recruiting visit the week before to BYU, where I ended up playing, and we were playing some pickup basketball in the in the uh, in the uh, PE gyms at BYU with uh, some of the guys of the team. And I had a ball in my hands, and Danny Ainge went to slap it away and hit my hit my top of my hand hard and broke my knuckle. And so I actually got a cast on that trip, and actually. Uh, the cast came off that that week or when I was at the McDonald's game, but uh, I didn't get to play. Wow. Well, at yeah. least you were able but to... But it was a great... 
Yeah, that 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 year was a great uh, recruiting class with a lot of guys who became Hall of Fame players, like uh, Ralph Sampson and Isaiah Thomas, Tommy Wilkins, and others. Right. Now, coming out of college, obviously we know you went to BYU, but what other offers did you have from other schools? Just about, I could have gone to just about any other school in the country, but I was a good student and a good player. So, but I, uh, my final choices, I mean, like a lot of players are highly recruited. I, <clears throat> you know, with my help, my, my decision and my parents and my high school coach had narrowed it down and, um, you know, we, we visited with some, uh, about 12, 15 schools, you know, in, in my home during the summer for my senior year, but my junior, and but started my senior year and narrowed it down to about five, five or six schools. So I went to visit officially UCLA, uh, Duke and BYU. And then I also kind of unofficially visited and I played all the time, University of Houston, Texas, SMU. You know, I was going to go on a trip to Kentucky too, but I, by that time I decided that I was going to BYU. So it was kind of my big final four was probably BYU, Duke, Kentucky, UCLA, and maybe Texas, Houston, and Houston. So why did you ultimately choose BYU? Uh, because it was overall the best, uh, I felt the best place for me. I had some. Family ties to the school. My mother had attended there and had some siblings they had. And that, that was, you know, that didn't hurt. And we had, uh, faith. We were the same faith that Church of Jesus Christ led our saints around the school, runs the school. So it was a great place, uh, spiritually and socially for me. But also the basketball program was in on the, back on the way up. They had, uh, Frank Arnold had been a coach, was our coach. He'd been the assistant coach with John Wood at UCLA just a few years before. And, uh, Danny Ainge was there. Fred Roberts was there. Um, he played in the NBA a long time. A few other guys who were, um, pretty good high school players and, and he ended up playing, you know, some professionally, some overseas. So, um, uh, it was, it was, uh, just a great place all around. It was a good decision to, you know, academically, socially, spiritually. Uh, I met my wife there who played on the women's team. So that was the, that was the best move of all. Right. Now, when I think about BYU basketball, I automatically think about the 2011 team that was really good with Jimmer Fredette. Now, you were actually a part of the best team that finished, that went on to the Elite Eight. Um, what was it like <coughs> playing? What was it like playing at that high level at BYU? Yeah, that was great. I mean, my sophomore year, Danny Andrews' senior year, we went to the. Uh... Elite Eight, we lost in the game, uh, to advance to the Final Four to Virginia. We had Ralph Sampson and, and, uh, Jeff Lamp and Rick Carlisle was on the team, but he was redshirting for Virginia. Uh, but, um, yeah, Sampson was, you know, uh, one of the top All Americans, incredible player in college and early years in the pros until he got, you know, injuries that slowed him down. But, uh, it was great. I mean, it was, all, it was a pretty awesome. We had a nice run. They would beat. Princeton, UCLA, and Notre Dame on a last minute, last uh, second shot by famous drive by Ames, and we lost to Virginia. So it was exciting. We never went that deep, or went actually my last two years, we didn't go to the NCAA again. But uh, in the refreshment year, we were kind of upset in the first round by Clemson. So that was a great run. And yeah, that's the deepest BYU's ever gotten the NCAA tournament. They actually won back in the fifties and sixties. The NIT tournament actually used to be bigger or as big as the NCAA tournament. They, they had two teams that won the NIT years ago. So uh, I'm sure a lot of different BYU fans would debate which is the greatest team, but that was a, we had a pretty darn good team. We had, uh, you know, like I said, myself, Fred Roberts, Danny Ainge, three guys who played anywhere you know, from 12 to 16 years in pro basketball and some other guys, Steve Trumbo played a dozen or so years overseas with the top teams in Spain and and a couple of other guys who played for professionally. So we had a lot of talent, and uh, uh, had a great team. For sure, no doubt. Now, we know that Danny Ainge also played for the Toronto Blue Jays at the same time he was in college, juggling a pro baseball career while also playing college basketball. Mm -hmm. um, would Danny ever talk about his MLB games 
with the team, with the basketball team, do you remember him ever talking about his baseball games? What was that like? No, uh, we would just ask him when he was going to ever learn to hit the curveball. <laughs> no, uh, a little bit. Yeah, we talked to Danny a little bit, and then when I, I played with Danny, actually, you know, in the NBA, I played with him for almost five years in Boston, and one in in uh, Sacramento. So uh, he had some uh, he had some great stories about playing in, uh, in in the in not only in the minors of Toronto but in the big leagues of Toronto. We had some fun baseball stories for sure. But uh, yeah, he was an incredible athlete. You know, he was a one of the few people ever who was a high school All American in all three basketball, baseball, football. He recruited by all of them. So he was one of the. Uh, those back, I think Dan Marino and then later John Elway did the same thing. He, it was, uh, that was early in the late seventies. The NCAA opened up where a guy could go to play in college, but still go play professionally in another sport like minor league baseball or pro baseball. And, uh, I think the only exception was they couldn't, they had to pay their way to school. They couldn't have a scholarship. But, um, so yeah, Danny at first, I think was going to play both baseball and, uh, and basketball at BYU, but Blue Jays drafted him pretty high, and and they played in the minor leagues, and it worked pretty well. And they you know, had some time to go up uh, now and then to the uh, majors, and then actually before his senior year, which he had a great year, was Player of the Year and in, in uh, College Player of the Year. Uh, the Blue Jays had signed him to a major league contract, so that was his plan. But that changed, uh, you know, after his senior year, and he. Uh, Celtics drafted them, and they worked it out with the Blue Jays finally to get a member of that contract and bring them to Boston full time. Right. When you talk about greatest athletes of all time, Danny Ainge is definitely up there with Deion Sanders, Charlie Ward, um, guys who are dual sport athletes, stuff like that. Now, after college, yeah, he was, he was a great multi sport athlete, good golfer, and yeah, excellent athlete. Yeah. All right. So after college, the Celtics draft you in the first round. Um, the Celtics had won the championship two years earlier already with established stars in Larry Bird and Kevin McHale. Um, what was it like knowing that you were going to a championship team already when you first got drafted? <clears throat> well, it was when I won, it was just awesome getting, you know, getting drafted in the first round, going to NBA, worked hard to get there and things worked out well for me too. It was, um, um, it was, uh, you know, going to a storied franchise like the, the Celtics and then being in the middle of the house of those, uh, bird years, slave bird years with the other Hall of Famers, Parrish and McHale and Dennis Johnson and later Bill Walton, you know, incredible bunch. I played with five Hall of Famers and, you know, they let me, the Hall of Fame let me buy a ticket to walk through the Hall of Fame. But uh, it was an uh, incredible bunch to play with. We had a great, uh, awesome, great teams. It was a great, you know, the, those '80s where the, the Lakers or the Celtics, uh, one or both, were in every finals in the uh, '80s. So it was a pretty cool thing to get uh, to to come into. You know, just coming into it, um, you know, it just felt natural. I mean, here's here's October. It's basketball season. It's time to get going. But it's kind of also sometimes you know, even though. It, Played in high school and in college and off season stuff with pro players and played with guys in high school and college who have gone on to the pros. You know now you're playing with not only them but uh, but but all of them. So the you know the level of play and the skill and the size was uh, incredible. And then you get that big adjustment to all the rookies. Get you go from playing thirty thirty five games a year in college to you know eighty two regular season back then eight exhibition games and. We went to the NBA Finals my first four years in a row, so there's another 20, 22 games. So we were playing, you know, uh, you know, 110 games, 120 games, whatever that adds up to, and, and uh, uh, it was uh, it was like getting a basketball PhD. It was pretty cool. What was it like to win that first championship against the Lakers in seven games in your rookie year? Uh, that was, that was awesome. I mean, and just, uh, it was, um, <clears throat> you know, one, they had, uh, you know, put the team together or they kept the team together and came back and, 
and won it. And it was a battle when that series is back and forth. It was a classic series, and and uh, uh, then and then we played the Lakers in the final three out of the next, uh, you know, three out of the, those those four years, and beat them again in '86, which with the '86 team, we're sure asked about that, but uh, it was uh, it was an awesome atmosphere, you know, with the. Uh, the Lakers Celtics rivalry and being being a part of it and get to get to contribute and play some. But eighty four was uh uh you know, as good as they get with a seven game series. Now the next season you go in against the Lakers again in the finals. Um what was the reaction from your team when you guys realized you had to play the Lakers once again in the finals? I wouldn't say it was a reaction. It was almost an expectation. You know, we were, um, you know, um, we didn't uh, really expect anyone to to beat them in the West. They were pretty dominant in the West. Uh, you know, 84 and 85, I mean, there was Portland and some other teams that were good teams. But, um, um, you know, so it was a big thing. It was a big thing we would watch. And I guess the good teams still do this now, but we would watch the standings, you know, all, all year long because we knew that best record was very important uh, in getting home, having home court advantage throughout the playoffs. And you know, so we were keeping our eye, even though you only play them twice during the regular season, we were keeping our eye on the far, not only who we were, you know, contenders in the East like Philly and the Knicks and, and uh, Milwaukee, and then later Detroit and Chicago and. And uh, Atlanta, but we were um, keeping an eye on the on the top team in the West because we wanted to have the best record. To you know if we scored off against them again, that we would have the home court advantage. Now, when you played against the Rockets in the finals in '86 and won the championship, how relieved were you guys that you didn't have to put, go against the Lakers in the finals? Oh, uh, we weren't relieved that we weren't uh, playing, playing the Lakers. I think we would have uh, liked to play the Lakers too, but the Rockets were a great challenge too. But our '86 team, you know, that was that was probably the, it's been been cited as you know it's one of the best of all time, and and uh, and we were really quick. You know, Bill Walton came in there and he's healthy, healthy most of the year. We picked up Jerry Seasting that year too, and and uh, we just were really going on all. All cylinders, and uh, so it's been interesting to, to to see how we would have done against the Lakers, but but the, the Rockets were no slouch. I mean, obviously they had you know Samson for a couple of years, and that was I think Samson's third year, and Hakeem Olajuwon's second year. So they hit their stride and made that breakthrough and, and upset you know the the Lakers for the Western Conference Championship. But we weren't. Uh, Did you and Danny kind of see it as revenge against Ralph Sampson since he had beaten you guys back in college in his Virginia days? <clears throat> um, I don't know if we thought about it that way, but you know, it was good to beat Ralph. Yeah, he got us that time, so it was good to, to beat Ralph. But it's a whole different set of circumstances, you know, a whole different team, and... Uh, Whole different level, so it was just uh, it was just awesome to be on that team. We won whatever sixty seven games or sixty six games or something, and you know one of our one of our goals. I've never heard any commentary or anything like this, but one of our goals was never lose two games in a row. And you know you you go out thinking you win every game. You should do when you're a good NBA team. You're not going to win every game, but. Um, uh, we never, we didn't ever lose two games in a row until the very last two games when things were wrapped up and they let, you know, bench guys like me and Carlisle and others play a little bit more. But, uh, but also in some of the starters were resting. But, um, we really clicked, you know, we really moved the ball, played good defense, and had it all. So, and, you know, that run of four years in a row to the finals, I mean, the, the Lakers probably went like six of the, six or seven of the ten years in the 80s to the finals, so, but it wasn't never four consecutive. Um, 
but the four years in a row, they've only been done, I think, once before, and then, you know, the Heat with LeBron James did it, and Dwayne Wade, and then, of course, the Warriors did it with five, but, uh, you know, it's interesting you see how the Warriors kind of broke down physically this last year. That takes a toll, you know. The Warriors bunch with their big three and, and all, they, they, they were younger, you know, than the, than the Celtics big three who were all in their early 30s or in the mid 30s by then. But, um, that four or five years in a row going to the finals, you just tell, you know, those guys are playing a lot of minutes, starters, but they just don't have, time for their bodies to fully recover and, and uh you know, basketball does that to any everybody, father time wins, like Barkley says. So eventually, you know, you're gonna get these these injuries, these torn killers, these bad backs, these uh you know other things. So that's kinda what hit us, you know, in eighty seven. Uh we had a lot of injuries. Uh Bill Walton didn't play most of the year. Kevin ended up with a broken foot, had a screw up, putting his foot up to the season. Bird started hobbling, Scott Wedman was out. So, Right, and you talk about those injuries. That just set me up for Game 3 of the 87 Finals where you had to guard Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Talk to me about that. Well, I didn't only guard him that game, but I, I, um, I because, you know, if I had any redeeming qualities or useful assets as a as an NBA player and some things coming around. I was I was a a decent one on one defender and pretty good post defender and could you know, strong and could grab a few rebounds and set a good screen and do some of the things like that. So one of the things that I um and even going back to my rookie year when we played the Lakers, I played a few minutes in the finals, but whether it was Kareem or somebody else, you know, one of the advantages of having a great post player like Kareem is that uh, they can score, or you go to double team them, and those guys like a Kareem are good passers, and so you know when they when you double team in half court, they just pick you apart with their passing and hit the open guy, the cutter, or the jump shot. So uh, one of the reasons that I played the spot minutes that I did uh, was um, because usually when I would guard a post guy, the Celtics wouldn't double team. I would play them straight up one on one. Doesn't mean you're stopping them. It just means you're making them work hard. Maybe you make them miss a shot or two, shoot a little further out. But I would, <clears throat> they in general, I'd play one on one. So that's that's why I would be in the game. And you know, plus you needed a few minutes here for Parrish or Walton or somebody. But then uh, I don't know if there was even a little foul trouble. But as much as in that game, it just things were going well with me in there. So KC just just rode with it, you know. And I played like whatever he said. 22 minutes and didn't score, but had about nine or 10 rebounds and, you know, some good defense and block shot. So, um, that was, you know, I had some other stretches where I played in the finals, probably not that many minutes, but, um, anyway, that was a lot of fun and it was great to win it. I was just kind of so ticked off that we, uh, we won that game three to kind of hang in there, but then we, we lost game four at home, which was a crusher. Do you remember the block that you had on Magic Johnson on the fast break layup? Do I what on the the block? Do you remember? Say again. Do you remember blocking Magic Johnson on the fast break layup? Yes, I do. And your offensive rebound? Yeah, yeah. Magic, ma- ma- Magic must not have had cable. He didn't. He didn't. He didn't. He didn't know the block shot. So he. I'm just kidding. That's what that's what Tree Rollins used to say when they're on they're on TBS all the time back then, and he'd, he'd block a guy's side and say, "You must not have had cable." <laughs> In other words, you weren't watching him to know the block shots. But yeah, I, mean, I could. I, I was uh, a good enough help defender and stuff like that, and get off my feet a little bit. I'd block a shot occasionally, so you know, everybody gets your shot blocked almost. Somewhere along the line, and, and Magic was no exception, so it was fun to make that play. In an interview after the game, Larry Bird called you the hardest worker on the team and said that your work ethic paid off. What does that mean to hear that from one of the greatest basketball players of all time? 
Uh, I just means that I paid Larry a few bucks. And no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, that was great to hear from Larry. I know Larry made some other uh, nice comments, you know, in, in other settings about me later and, you know, some books I've read and things like that. And it's good to hear. Um, yeah, it's always good to get, uh, everybody likes positive feedback. It's so great to be, uh, you know, appreciated by, uh, uh, you know, all your teammates, but uh, certainly a great Hall of Famer or things like that. It's, 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 uh, uh, very nice. Now you go from playing with a team that's basically in the finals every year um, to a team that finished last in the Los Angeles Clippers. Um, what is that experience like playing with a top team and then going all the way to the bottom? <clears throat> yeah, it's like night and day uh, as far as obviously the the team's uh, level of play and uh, and uh, the um, you know the, the the fan interest and. You know, L.A. versus Boston, you know, uh, go to the beach after practice and play beach volleyball or hang out with our little kids stand at the beach and, you know, just, uh, versus the cold of Boston and, um, um, and the, uh, kind of the, the, I won't say chaos, but, uh, yeah, well, chaos might be a good word, but a little bit of just kind of seemingly disorganization that the Clippers was. We, practice in a lot of different gyms. We were never in the same place. I learned later that was probably just part of Donald Sterling's not paying bills. <laughs> and uh, but So it was different, but on the other hand, it was a great opportunity for me. And we're still the NBA. There's still NBA players. And, um, you know, the NBA is just having that. Uh, sure, you got super talented players, all-stars, Hall of Famers on some teams. Some teams you don't, but you still got you guys are very capable, and you know, any any night you can beat somebody else. So it was actually um, I miss Boston, miss being on the championship teams, but it was a great opportunity. I enjoyed being with the Clippers; it was a great opportunity. I got to play a lot, a lot more. I got to start a lot of games, uh, play a lot of minutes, get more confidence and experience as a player. Whereas, you know, like in Boston and in good teams now, good teams anywhere, you don't have room to give. Uh, young guys uh, to go out there and make a lot of mistakes and play because every game's so important. You know, now now the G League helps out a little bit because young guys can go down and you know it can be the tenth, eleventh man, twelfth man, and go down and get some G League experience. But um, so so a whole totally different situation with a bad team like the Clippers. Hey, you know. <laughs> We're going to go play whoever we play. And, you know, sometimes like Benoit Benjamin was the center and he was not always ready or, or healthy or able to play. Or sometimes he just wasn't you know, given them what they wanted. So they put me in or start me. So it was a, it, that, you know, those, that year and a half in with the Clippers, a little bit with the Hornets a year later with the Sacramento Kings were all, uh, great experiences, great years for me, even though they're bad teams that gave me a chance to, help, you know, make me a better NBA player by getting more time. What was it like playing with Muggsy Bogues in Charlotte? Uh, well, I was there briefly. It was, you know, it was the first year with Charlotte, just a little brief six weeks or something, two weeks, so two months, something like that. So uh, Charlotte was a buzz, you know, it was new with, uh, you know, uh, with the uh, expansion franchise, uh, People still love them there, but they, you know, they really were big interest there. So it was, uh, it was, it was nice. Got a good chance there to do some, had some good minutes and play. And uh, thought I might have a chance to go back there, but it uh, made some interest. But you know, I ended up signing with Sacramento the next year. But uh, Muggsy, I'm just, I'm just glad I wasn't a ball handler. <laughs> and, and Muggsy had to guard me because he was, he was a, he was a tough guy on, on. Uh, getting steals and tough guy to cover for guys. So. Now, although we never saw Muggsy dunk in a game, did you ever see him dunk in practice? Do you know if he could dunk? I don't know. I don't ever remember if he did. I don't know. Never, I don't even remember ever hearing if he could or did. 
Well, that would be something. Uh, he was, you know, there's been other guys, five, seven, Spud Webbs, and in that, in that range, but Muggsy is probably the, he's the shortest guy ever that I've played against everyone throughout my years in the league. And if he could dunk, I, I don't know. But, but that would be a, a guy his size, whatever he was, five, five, or whatever. You know, that would be a, <laughs> a nice feat. You also played with Dell Curry on that team. What was it like playing with Dell? Ah, uh, with Dell, I should have, I, I should have hung out more with Dell and, and uh, said, Dell, if you're ever going to be uh, have kids, I'm going to. Well, actually, his kid his son was. I think his son was born then. I said, I'll be. I should have been his agent. Is <laughs> what I should have done. Now, Dell is a really good guy, nice guy, and obviously an incredible pro and, and great. Uh, you know, great shooter even then. Uh, I mean, great shooter always throughout his career, but uh, he was a good guy, a nice guy to play with. Right. So in Orlando, you go there and play four seasons. Your first season, Scott Skiles had the famous 30 assists in a game. What do you remember about that game? Um... One, we knew about the assist record, you know, and then as, at least as it's approaching the mark, but also, um, two, it was, um, it was kind of the perfect game for it. It was when the Denver Nuggets were playing the Nuggets and the Nuggets were, um, uh, Paul Westhead was coaching him. He was running that, uh, kind of system that he'd run in Loyola of Marymount where the Nuggets were trying to do something that NBA teams don't usually do because of the skill level. Of the ball handling, the passing, and shooting, they were they were pressing most of the game, most of the game, all the game. But then they were also, um, you know, putting the putting shots up at a really uh, high pace. So they're um, so they're, they're, the game, the, the scoring totals in the games against them were you know higher than average usually. So that game was I don't remember what our we scored, but I think we scored well over 130 points. So there were a lot of baskets made, so a lot of chances for Skiles to. Assist, but Scott was a tough, smart, um, you know, um, um, and good, good, good skilled uh, point guard and basketball player. So I was, you know, happy for him, and, and uh, uh, it's cool, you know, being in a game where he did that. Right, and now the third season in Orlando, the Magic drafted Shaquille O'Neal with the first pick. Um, you played with a lot of Hall of Famers in your career, but did you see anyone as dominant as Shaq was? Uh, well, first of all, with Shaq, you know, the first the first two years before I was there, I started. Well, my first year, every game, then the next year, I probably started half or more of the games. And so they gave him my starting job, and I don't know why. They've never explained it to me. But uh, I'm just kidding, obviously. But no, Shaq, uh, you know, what was Shaq, and unique about Shaq is that um, he's got that, you know, body made by Fisher, and he's got, he's more powerful. Uh, he's got as much power as any athlete, and power is actually a, you know, uh, a measurable athletic quantity of, of you know, how fast with how much force you can move something, and to have somebody his size. Uh, that had that much strength and, and quickness that could move that quickly and, you know, run the floor and go through guys or go over guys or go around guys. And, uh, it was, was pretty incredible. I mean, a guy like Charles Barkley or plenty of other players, really powerful players, but nobody's seven one, you know, 320, 330 in shape with, uh, uh, his body and build. And so that was, um, so that was always different about him. Matt Gukas, our coach, had played in with the uh, Philadelphia Warriors, I guess it was, or, or, or 76ers when Wilt Chamberlain was there. And, uh, and, uh, he, I think he said, you know, those, Wilt was the closest thing he could, although he's a little different, but closest thing to, to he'd ever seen in the league to Shaq as far as his body and his physical. Makeup, so and and then Shaq loved to play. He was, he was a good guy, played hard, and, and uh, worked on his skills, became better. Player, and also, definitely a very very dominant player. But 
you know, you can look at a lot of NBA players, all stars, even Hall of Famers, and you can go and look and say, man, there's a guy, oh yeah, he reminds me of so and so, you know, body type or the way he plays. You know, maybe it was somebody who played 10 years ago or 15 years ago, but like with Shaq, like I say, it's, it's almost impossible to find a guy who was built and put together and had the, the physical tool, the athleticism ever in the history of NBA. So there's, other than maybe Walt Chamberlain, nobody, you know, nobody, nobody close to that was what he had. Now, can you share the story about your, happened there. Yeah, the story about your kids writing a letter to Larry Brown when you were on the Pacers? Uh, yeah, it was funny. Um, yeah, so we played in, uh, <clears throat> we actually lived in Orlando uh, my whole career. Uh, I'm a wife from here, and, um, so even back when I was playing in Boston, we'd come to Orlando in the summers and we'd play with those other teams. So when I got to play with the Magic those four years, that was great. And then uh, after my fourth year, or during my fourth year, Shaq's second year, I got hurt, hurt my Achilles. I recovered, but the next year, after the next exhibition season, uh, Magic let me go, so I was able to sign. I first played with the Knicks for a little while while well, Pat Williams was, I mean, Pat Williams, Herb Williams was hurt, and then I played with the, Pacers the rest of the year, so we ended up with the Pacers that we were, we ended up playing the Magic in the NBA um, Eastern Conference Finals. And so I'd been gone up there to Indiana for, you know, four months. My uh, wife and kids were down here and saw them maybe a little bit. They may have come and visit once, but, uh, you know, come down here. So anyway, we're playing here in the series. It was pretty cool. And so we had a charter plane and, uh, uh, there was permission, got permission. Sometimes I, there was room for some family on there. So my twin girls who are oldest were maybe, um, I don't know, how old were they then? It was, they were probably about, uh, eight, seven or eight, uh, rode back with us as long, along with, uh, my wife's youngest sister who was like late teens and it kind of was, you know, watching them for me while they stayed in India, Indianapolis with us for, uh, um, the next two games, and um, anyway, so they wrote Larry Brown a, I think a thank you letter for letting him, you know, come and ride on the plane, and but they also said something like, "P.S. Put my put my dad in the game," <laughs> and and uh, and I think he, I think it that came out because he mentioned it in the, you know, thought it was cute, and he mentioned it in a uh, interview or something, and it was. I think the next game we were at played the. Uh, and played a lot, but the next game I did play some. <laughs> so, but that may have just been because they needed me a few minutes against Shaq. It was, you know, for Shaq and Rick Smith. We had the Davis brothers, so we had a lot of big guys, but, um, but yeah, that was a pretty fun story where the girls wrote a, a letter to him and, and I, and I did end up going to the game and Larry liked it enough that he mentioned it in the, to the, to the press. Right. Now, Tell me about the Florida Basketball Association, and are you still the commissioner there? Yeah, I still am, still hanging in there, and uh, we're about to merge with the NBA, so I can't say too much about it. No, I'm just, just messing. No, obviously, no way to merge in the NBA. Um, there's a gentleman named Mark King who um, <clears throat> had been involved in minor league basketball, and you know, minor league basketball in the U.S. outside of. Um, the G League, which is now, you know, uh, from became a D League, they're now whatever 15 years old because it's got the backing of the NBA. Minor league basketball in the U.S. is, you know, a, 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 um, an alphabet, a graveyard alphabet soup of all these initials of all these leagues of uh, USBL, CBA, GBA, whatever, whatever BA you can think of. And so, uh, about, I don't know how many years FBA is now, seven or eight years. Um, and a gentleman named Mark King had come down here from Kentucky, He'd played a little bit of small college basketball, got involved with a minor league team up there and then down here and he moved down here to Orlando with his wife and, uh, decided to start his own team called the Florida Flight. And, uh, he, a friend of mine he had, he'd asked him to be the coach and they asked me to be the, general manager of that team that year and we played in this minor league that 
WBL or something like that that uh, went out of business the next year and half the team, you know, we had a couple teams in Florida and about three in Georgia and one in Tennessee and one in Mississippi and half the time, the, the especially as we got later in the season, the other road teams wouldn't even show up or they'd be late, you know. And uh, and so he said, you know, this is one of the killers was that you had these minor leagues that they tried to play long seasons and that they tried to do it over long distances and created upon traveling and travel budgets and things like that. So FBA was Mark's idea and they asked me to be the commissioner of it and it's not a lot of something I put a lot of time into but uh, they uh, have gone on now with these seasons and they just have teams in Florida and you know most of them are within a at the most a three or four hour drive of each other and they play a kind of small season in the um, spring and in early summer of about um, typically about 12 to 14 regular season games in a playoff and uh so it's a time when um, you know some guys who we we get some guys off and on who played overseas. We've had uh, we had one guy from this year who was um, in the uh, uh, training camp with the uh, what's the, the Lakers G League team, the Defenders. I think he was in there. He was in the training camp. We had one guy who played a little bit in the uh, G League. We've had guys that go you know who played overseas or guys who come here. And, so it's kind of like, uh, if you will, it's kind of like maybe the comparison of uh, in um, Major League Baseball, the independent minor league in Major League Baseball, maybe a maybe even a a rookie league level or an A league level. So it's not guys, you know, in general. It's because they want to just keep playing, and it's a few of them who do have chances to play in other leagues around uh, around the world, but. Uh, yeah, but not uh, guys that are usually going to be G League caliber or top European or international club cal- cal- uh, caliber. But uh, but anyway, they do a good job. You know, family try to keep the family entertainment and uh, you know, build a little uh, uh, um, fan support, community support, and just get involved in things. Mark King does a great job of running his his team, and I'm just there to kind of help and give advice and hand out a trophy every once in a while. Right. Now, just a couple more questions, and then I'll let you go. Um, what do you think of the Celtics team this year? Uh, I really like it. I think that it's, uh, you know, uh, I was, you know, I've always followed the Celtics, and uh, it's been great. I like, uh, you know, had a chance to meet them, been up there, compliance with Brad Stevens, I, you know, as he, he, he well deserves accolades he gets as a good coach. But I think the, uh, I, I thought I was really worried, and I think, you know, in the long haul, still, they really don't have that, but they lost losing, uh, in Kemba, Wa- I mean, uh, Kyrie was one thing, but I think with what they, uh, Kemba brings them, I think they're actually, they're, they're better in some ways, you know, um, and, and it doesn't miss a beat, and it's hoping it brings up for, um, you know, like uh, uh, Brown and um, um, Tatum again and others. But I thought what was going to hurt him was, you know, just not having the experience and the steadiness of like Al Horford and the defense and the other stuff of Aaron Baines. And so they're a little shy on the big guys. So, I, you know, I wonder, you know, if that's going to, how much it's going to impact him as we're getting a playoff matchup. But then again, too, maybe that's something, you know, that they're, they're working on, hey, can they pick up a, another veteran big guy? What do you like about Jason Tatum's Who's game? Tatum? Uh, Tatum's just a uh, you know solid player with a good feel for the game. He plays both ends of the floor, but just uh, is, um, you know, talented, but just a smart, you know, offensive player. And so he's a... They picked Danny and their, their staff do a great job of evaluating uh, not only talent, but also how guys fit together, you know, on the team. Because that's, that's really important, you know, having the pieces that um, fit together well and complement each other and that, uh, and, and then, uh, you know, you, you can tend or become a, 
a good team is not only that individual experience, but that collective experience. And so, uh, so it's good to see the Celtics doing well. It's still going to be, we still got some tough competition, you know, obviously in the East, how much the, the Bucks play the magic here while we're talking. So Bucks are number one and, and Toronto and, uh, Philly and somebody else out there. Right. Um, but the Celtics could, uh, could make a good run in the East and, you know, there's no, it's kind of wide open for the NBA finals this year too, so. Now the Lakers, do you see them potentially playing the Celtics in the finals this year? And do you see that rivalry from when you played potentially coming back? Uh, yeah, I mean, any Celtics Lakers series is going to gain a lot of interest just because of the tradition of the fans. Um, and I, you know, it'll be some rivalry, but, but, but that, there won't be match like that bird magic here just because of the history behind it. And, you know, so I mean, hey, obviously if they could both get to the finals, it'd be a great thing. If, uh, TV ratings would love it. I'd like it. Uh, it would be, um, a lot of fans would like it. Uh, probably, you know, probably better odds that the Lakers will get there than the Celtics, but you never know. You never know. And hey, if they're both, uh, healthy and they were to get back there, um, you know, again the next year, if, you know, that's kind of what breeds, besides the history of the rivalry, but that's what really heated it up is you're back there almost, you know, several years in a row or, or every other year, that kind of thing. Right. Now, last question for you. Um, who would you say in the NBA most reminds you of your game? Uh, probably Giannis Antetokounmpo. I'm, I'm, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I mean, there's guys who are kind of built like me a little bit, and, and uh, um, you know, there's not much happening in the post these days, not, not a lot. Um, but um, I don't know. Aaron Baines, uh, um, Maybe a Steven Adams a little bit, although he's, he's, he's a lot better than I am. He's a, he's a pretty good player in a lot of ways. Um, not so as good as any of these guys. I really like him. I like Brooke Lopez, you know, you're playing with the, uh, the, um, um, uh, the Bucks. And, uh, yeah, I pay attention to follow the big guys, like the big guys, but I don't know. There's, there's always, you know, there's somebody else out there. I just don't. I can't think of all of them. But there's other guys that are kind of, you know, my body type and size. That's more what I guess I, I would think of it. Versus, I'm not. I'm not Rudy Gobert. I'm not Joel Embiid. I'm not you know big and long and on arms like that kind of thing.